everyone, Paul Massetta here with InfluentialMind.com and I'm really excited to bring you this video today. It is a miserable rainy day here in uh, New York City and I figured it would be a great uh, day for me to share with you some interesting stuff that I have uh, found recently, some interesting case studies on subliminal influence, which I think everyone's always interested in that and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to reduce or overcome resistance when you talk to people when you present to them when you try to influence them so the first thing I want to do is talk to you about this case study which is really really interesting stuff which I'm gonna cheat a little bit here and I'm gonna grab my iPad because I remember some of the details but I can't rattle everything off the top of my head so I, uh, I'm gonna grab this and go over it with you so the first thing, uh, basically the purpose of this case study is to show you how important it is when you influence people to influence them subliminally, to bypass the critical factor or the conscious mind and go right to the subconscious mind when you really want to influence someone. Now, statistically, by age 66, we will have seen approximately 2 million television commercials. Now here's what's crazy. In 1965, the typical consumer recalled 34% of the ads that they saw. In 1999, it shrunk down to 8%, and by 2007, that number went down to an alarmingly small 2.21%. So what that says is that we, let's think about this for a second. So we have these big companies out there that are spending all kinds of money on advertising, so much money, putting so much advertising in front of us that by, by, by age 66, we'll have seen approximately 2 million TV commercials. The crazy part is that as of, what are we, we're in 2013 now, as of six years ago, only 2.2% of those ads were recalled on average by each person. So God only knows where that's at now. Right now, where I want to go with this is I want to show you how smart companies, smart advertisers use subliminal advertising, subliminal influence to really get through to the customer or the potential customer. So we're going to go back to 2008 and we're going to talk about American Idol. It's a big TV show. I think it came over from England. It's really big in the U.S. now, uh, or at least it was anyway. And at the time, American Idol had three main sponsors. The three main sponsors were AT&T, Ford, and Coca-Cola. Each one spending around $26 million per year to run their ads on American Idol, which is actually small. In 2007, in a study by PQ Media, they found that companies spent, on average, $3.36 billion on advertising, right? So, here's the deal. Coke and AT&T use covert influence, covert advertising, while Ford uses more overt influence. They kind of come right out and say, you know, here's what I got, here's what you, here's why you should buy it, here's our new car, blah blah blah. Now, in uh now here's an example of how Coke uses the covert influence. In 2008, Simon Cowell, one of the judges on the show, was asked by a fellow judge how much he liked the contestant song, and he replied by saying, "How much do I love Coca-Cola?" and he took a sip of the drink. The judges also kept the drink in front of them at the judging table and both the, judge and, the judges and contestants sat on chairs with contours that actually make them look like bottles of Coca-Cola. They were red chairs that were shaped like Coca-Cola bottles. I know it sounds weird, trust me it's true. Now Singular also uses the covert influence, they go the subliminal route. Um, Ryan Seacrest, the host of the show, would remind people that they could dial in or text their vote from an AT&T wireless phone, which was the only carrier at the time that American Idol would let people cast their vote using for free. If you went to an outside character ca carrier, you'd have to pay an additional fee, right? now. Follow me here. Ford spent their money on 30 second ads, traditional 30 second TV commercials that you typically see when you watch a show. 
Now, a study done by Professor Silberstein, this is a, a study that I picked up in a really cool book called Biology, B-U-Y-ology, which is uh, which is really focused on what we call neuromarketing. Neuromarketing is basically when you attach people's brains to MRI scanners, um, and monitor their brain activity while they watch advertisements. So you can see, literally you can see which parts of their brains are being activated or engaged when they're watching um, a, an advertisement. So Professor Silberstein uh, conducted a study on 400 subjects and he put black turban-like caps on them which were wired with about a dozen electrodes to measure their emotional engagement, their memory, and what attracted or repelled them when they watched uh, the ad. They were presented with 20 logos, some including Ford, AT, and, uh, AT&T, and Coke, as well as what they called unbranded logos, which were from companies that had no products placed in the show American Idol and they were also big companies some of them included Verizon eBay and Target each one of these appeared for one second it, uh, they appeared for one second on a screen while the subjects watched it then they watched a 20 minute segment of American Idol and they also watched another show which would serve as the benchmark to validate the final results um, when they rescreened the same uh, after that and then they rescreened the same sequence of logos three times now what they wanted to find out was which logos uh, people remembered the most and which ones they didn't because memory of a product has been shown to be the best measure of an ad's effectiveness, right? So this is how these companies are measuring whether or not the ads are working. Does the, does the person who watches the ad, do they remember the, the ad? Do they remember the product, the service, or the company? So what they found was that the branded logos were recalled much more than the unbranded uh, logos, and that the branded logos actually inhibited the recall for the unbranded lo uh, logos. And the final results showed that Coca-Cola was a lot more memorable, way more memorable than AT&T and Ford, but subjects actually remembered less about Ford than they did before they even entered the study. Now here's the deal, that's, that's what's really surprising about this, right? Is that if you forget about every other part of the study, the bottom line is, is that Coke and AT&T were remembered more, right? And they were used covertly. Ford was used overtly. Not only did it fail miserably, but it was actually remembered less. So what's happening is the, the covert influence, the subliminal message is actually pushing out the explicit message or the overt message, making the covert message more memorable. Now, what was Coke's key to success? Very simply, the reason why they were remembered more is because they were integrated 60% of the time into the show. So there, there was a presence of Coca-Cola, whether it was, like I said, on the table, someone was sipping it, they had chairs that were shaped like Coca-Cola, but it was integrated 60% of the time and it played an integral part of the storyline. So what that means is that people are mentally subconsciously without realizing it, tying Coca-Cola to all the dreams and aspirations of the people on the show, people that want to blow up and become big stars. And they're, they're, they're identifying Coca-Cola with what they're watching, so they're becoming engaged. And here, like I said, is the crazy thing. Not only are they remembering Coca-Cola more, but they're remembering the overt stuff less. Right? So what does that tell us? That tells us that if we really want to influence people, if we really want to get people to say yes, we got to do it on a subconscious level, right? So part of that, part of this all ties into resistance. And the reason why is because, you know, theoretically you could learn everything there is to know about influence, persuasion, selling, conversational hypnosis. At some point you're going to encounter resistance from somebody, right? Not everybody is going to be like, yeah, whatever, I'll buy whatever you want, where do I sign? doesn't usually work like that. A lot of times there's going to be resistance. So what I want to talk to you today is about overcoming resistance the way Milton Erickson, who I consider to be and many other people share the same opinion, to be the greatest hypnotist of our time. Right. So what Erickson realized very early in his career and where he decided to change things was that direct suggestion leads to rejection. Right. So what happens is a lot of times when you directly 
uh, suggest something to someone, it causes them to put up an immediate barrier. It causes them to just instinctively build up a wall. So like if you're a hypnotist and you're trying to get someone to stop smoking and you ask them, you know, why are they smoking so much? They're automatically going to put up these defense mechanisms and try to justify why they are smoking so much. And it's going to, it's going to present a problem for you, right? So now, what Erickson realized is that the habit, so in that case, like the smoking, wasn't actually a problem. It was an opportunity to utilize to get into the subconscious mind of the subject. And he did that by showing genuine interest or at least creating the perception that he was genuinely interested in helping the person solve their problem. So instead of asking them, why do you smoke so much? He would ask them, what is it about smoking that you enjoy so much? He would ask them covert questions that are kind of just building genuine interest in wanting to know what it is about the particular habit that the person enjoys so much. If he was asking them about eating junk food and they said something like, well, I like to eat chocolate a lot, he would say something like, I agree, I, li I like eating chocolate a lot too. So he would start to build rapport around that instead of coming out and overtly or directly asking them why they're doing things that they know are not good for them. And in doing that, Erickson kind of changed the face of hypnosis, right? And he changed the face and he basically created conversational hypnosis, right? He created this dynamic where you can talk to people and you can completely bypass that critical factor and move right into the subconscious mind so you can start implanting suggestions. Now, uh, one, of the, one of the most powerful ways, uh, one of the most powerful tools that you can use to do that are hypnotic language patterns, right? And today I want to share two of them with you. They're real simple. They're real easy to use. Very, very effective, all right? The first one is the agreement pattern. And like I said, it's very simple. You just basically want to replace the word but with the word and, right? So let's look at the difference between and and but. And is an inviting word. But is a defensive word right? So every time you use the word but, regardless of what you're trying to convey to someone, when you use the word but, everything that you said before that word gets pushed out the window. And it, everything that you say after it completely contradicts in the mind of your subject what you said before that, right? So if, for instance, you had like an employee at your job, let's say you're a manager and they're asking for a raise and you, you know, you're not ready to give them the raise yet, right? So typically what you would say is, listen, I think you're really doing a good job, but it's not time for you to get the raise yet or but I think you need to do a little bit more work or but I think we need to see a little bit more from you or I think you're doing a great job, but I need you to take care of a couple of more projects before we get you to that raise. What's going to automatically happen on a subconscious level is that person is automatically going to erase that part where you said, I think you're doing a great job. That's going to get totally erased and go out the window. Now, in a situation like this, where you're kind of the power player and they're the subordinate, it might not be as important to you. But in situations where you really, where the, where the social interaction is very important to you and you have a lot to gain out of it, you don't ever want to use the word but. Instead, you want to replace it with the word and. So in the same situation, you would say something like, I think you've been doing a great job and I look forward to promoting you once you're able to take on these next few things or once we reach the six month benchmark or whatever the case may be. It completely does a great job of not getting rid of or eliminating the first part of that sentence. So the agreement pattern is just basically what you're doing is when you have to disagree with someone or you have to provide an answer that you know that they're not going to like, just don't use the word but. Use the word and. Now here's the thing. This takes some practice. You gotta get used to doing it. We're all conditioned to say but, myself included. The more you get used to using the word and instead of the word but, the easier the, the agreement pattern will come to you. Uh, the second one that I wanna talk to you about is the thought disruption pattern, which basically is you wanna disrupt someone's particular thought pattern or their pattern of thought so that you can get them to agree with you or to want what you have to offer. So here's what you do. Ideally, you want to talk about your offer. You want to talk about something uh, that's important to you that 
you need to make a point to them. And maybe they're like in another place, they're not focused, they're not paying attention, um, that they, they, you just don't have them engaged. So the first thing that you do, step one, is you create a diversion statement, right? And a diversion statement could be like something like, hey, great game last night, if they're interested in sports. Or you could say something like, this weather is really crazy. Or you could bring up something that you saw on the news that you're pretty sure that they might have saw. That probably wouldn't work for me because I don't watch the news, but um, you know, you can use a public event. You just want to create a diversion statement. You want to use something to grab their attention, right? Then you want to wait for their response, okay? If they don't respond to it, you have to do it again, right? And maybe you might want to wait a few minutes and you know, kind of wait for the right time to do it again, but you have to wait for their response. Once you get the response, you want to ask for agreement. So what that means is you want to ask a question that you're pretty sure that they're going to agree to. So something like, wouldn't you want to make more money in life? Or wouldn't you love to like do what you love to do for a living and make money from it in the process? All those things, all those questions are questions that most people are going to answer with a yes, or they're going to agree with the statement. Once you ask for agreement and you have them in the process of agreeing with you, you then want to introduce your topic. Okay, so you change the frame of mind. What you're, all you're doing very simply is you're taking that state of mind where the person's currently in, which is unfavorable for you because you don't have them engaged, and you want to convert them or transform them into a state of mind where they're not only engaged, but they're in agreement with you. They're in a state of mind where they're prepared to agree with you. In sales, this is classic. In sales, what we used to do is we would just ask a series of yes questions. So anytime I was taking somebody on a presentation of a product or service, I would constantly ask them questions. Again, I would ask for agreement. Constantly ask them questions that are going to result in them saying yes, so that by the time I present the offer to them, they're so conditioned to saying yes that it's hard for them to say no. And the beauty of this whole thing is that it's dangerously effective, super powerful, but super easy to use. And the reason why it's super easy is because all you're doing is capitalizing off what's going on already, off what people naturally, organically, instinctively do by nature. Uh, it's funny, you know, I started taking Brazilian Jiu Jitsu classes, which is the art of grappling or the art of ground fighting, where it's a martial art where you learn how to fight on the ground. If you watch uh, UFC or mixed martial arts, you'll see that a great part of that fighting happens on the ground where you want to. It basically what it enables you to do is it enables the it enables a fight to be won on other predicates besides strength or speed or things of that nature. So theoretically, the smaller, slower guy can still win a fight with someone that's bigger or larger simply because when you take the fight to the ground, you eliminate the speed, you eliminate most of the power, and instead you're working on a dominance and positioning to try to submit someone. The point of the story is that when I started taking the classes, I initially w wanted to take private sessions with the guy who runs the whole place because I didn't want to be in the middle of a class with a bunch of guys that knew a lot more than me. So I'd rather pay a little bit extra to get the private sessions. And at first he thought it was going to be a scheduling conflict. And he was saying to me, well, I don't think you, my schedule is really tight. And I said, listen, I'm self-employed. I work from home. I can work my schedule around you. And he was like, well, what do you do for a living? And every time somebody asks me what I do for a living, I kind of first have to look at them and think of how, of what type of a person they are and then think of how I want to answer that question. And the, 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 most, the simplest answer that I've begun to come, up to come up with for people is I show other people how to convert human communication into power. Now, some people look at me when I say that and they're like, what? What does that mean? What it means is that I show you and you can, all I'm doing is pointing out to you what's already there. I'm not actually teaching you anything. I'm only making you more aware of it. It's how you take human communication, what we're already doing instinctively and naturally, and converting it into power, using it advantageously. And that's the beauty of this. So um, I actually have a good book called Hypnotic Language Patterns. It's a, it's a, it's a program. It's a uh, digital book and it comes with three audio modules which covers the agreement pattern, the thought disruption pattern in detail. I also give you examples of how you can use that stuff. I also show you other patterns which show you how to disarm people and uh, lower their resistance. 
And basically, the program shows you how to get people in the desired state of trance that you want them in so you can begin implanting suggestions in their mind using certain verbal patterns that cause them to say yes. Uh, the book retails for 75 bucks. There's a special link underneath the video. If you wanna purchase it now, you can do it through that link and you'll only pay 27 bucks for it. So I think you save like, uh, I don't know, 60% or whatever off the list price. Also comes with a one year guarantee like all my products do. So you can take it, download it, use it for the next year. If you don't like it, if you decide you just don't like me and it's not gonna work for you or whatever, you could just send me an email, paul at influentialmind.com. I'll give you a full refund and you can keep the book. I hope you enjoyed what I shared with you today and I look forward to sharing more information with you. Have a good one.